this short documentary series on the humanities in Europe today, uh, which starts from Europe but will expand to cover, I hope, the whole world, is the initiative of the European network of humanities centres and institutes. We decided collectively with our colleagues that it would be a good idea to present a series of portraits of leading figures in the humanities in our part of the world and to use them as sources of inspiration, as role models, if you wish, for practitioners and students alike. The portraits of these very uh, sort of charismatic, highly accomplished, distinguished professionals accomplishes another aim. It allows us to trace a genealogical sort of portrait of where the humanities have been, where they are at today and where they could go. Insofar as each person that we interview is asked to trace their own itinerary, past, present and future. And simply by asking a question like, what was your faculty called when you studied as an undergraduate? And noticing the semantic, the institutional, the political transformations that the field has gone through. Just by doing that, I think the viewers should be in a position to measure the extent of the changes and the extent of the vitality of the field. The hope of this mini-series is indeed that we can collectively as practitioners but also as spectators express our love for, our trust in, our respect for this amazing field of the humanities at a time in its history when it is coming under attack in the press, in the public debate, um, in policy making and financial decisions that are really penalising this field. The humanities in the 21st century, as you will see in the different portraits of these great figures we're offering to you, are a vital, vibrant, critical, creative, extremely accountable field, proud of its history, confident of its place in the world, and very hopeful for the future. We really hope that you will enjoy uh, watching these great figures and maybe you will be yourself tempted to run out and interview somebody that you know in your own neighborhood, in your own circles, because the humanities are everywhere and for everybody. I, I, I see myself as, as a gender studies scholar, uh, that's for sure, and as a philosopher of science. Um, so these are two interdisciplinary fields and two relatively new fields. So in, and, and of course gender studies is younger than philosophy of science, but philosophy of science started in the 1930s. Of course, the minute you say that something started, you immediately create a bibliography and it has always been there, but it's at least 40 years older than, than gender studies. I finished high school in 1996 um, and I went to the university aged 17 in 1996. I really wanted to do something around feminism because it was literally, when I was young, was the only frame of reference that I had. My parents are from a baby boomer generation. They decided to raise my sister and me as flexible, as fluid, as open, as radical uh, as possible. But it meant that I didn't get any framework. I didn't get um, a strong class, uh, a strong idea of a class background. I didn't get a strong religious education. I basically got a very liberal upbringing from my parents, which also meant that, uh, and at school the same thing, I think I went to peace education when I was a young child, but uh, my high school didn't really offer any frameworks, any perspectives to, uh, through which or with which to view the world. And accidentally I bumped onto uh, a feminist shelf uh, at the library, at the very small library in my hometown in the north of the Netherlands. And I read all the books and I decided, wow, this is actually, feminism is a thinking tool. I, I look at the world differently through feminism. So then I decided I wanted to, to, to take this up uh, in my future education. And I really wanted to learn more about feminism and also contribute to feminism. And, think about what a political, I mean, I, I couldn't really phrase it in those terms yet, but what a more political form of knowledge production would be, because that is, that is what I experienced, the epistemic twist. Uh, I experienced it, you know, behind my little desk in the north of the Netherlands. Of course, I didn't know the name. Uh, it was before the internet. I mean, even my generation of scholars 
I had to choose a subject without the internet. So I was reliant on someone at school who said, well, I think you should go to this and this and this university in Amsterdam and study woman and labor. That was the program. Of course, I didn't like that necessarily and needed to, needed to move toward the humanities to actually do what I wanted to do. It was in the social and cultural sciences faculty. Uh, actually, the interesting thing is that one of the founders of this program is now our Minister of Education, Jet Bussemaker, and she was working there. So uh, there were immediately role models around, but I didn't necessarily like the idea that what I immediately noticed on my first day, they said that the woman and labor, the uh, the sex, it was, I think it was called sex and cultural sciences or something like that. So it had already transformed into something else, but it was being merged with ethnicity and with disability studies. Uh, so it was going to be called societal issues and policy, uh, which was not very appealing to me because I wanted to know something about knowledge production. Um, so I talked to my teachers and they told me, well, we're not really supposed to tell you this, but um, I think the University of Amsterdam is better for you. The program was called Women's Studies. Um, it was a free bachelor, so it didn't really exist uh, in the books. It was a, a special program that could be designed by the students as part of political science. And the faculty was called Polit Social and Political Sciences. It was called, it was the seventh faculty of the famous seventh political activist faculty of the University of Amsterdam, where Saskia Poldevaart and Petra de Vries set up this uh, free bachelor. And uh, with free, I mean that it, it was literally, uh, it was offered informally to students, but it, it wasn't a real program. And my degree says, uh, Bachelor of Political Science with and then on my list of grades it says that I, I basically followed the special program women's studies so that's that's the cartography. Feminism gave me structure both personally and academically um, it, it gave me personal structure because I was not uh, raised by my parents uh, according to a set of values because the idea was that I would pick up the values myself. Well, the value that I picked up, the main one was feminism. So um, in terms of academic education, uh, I went to the Free University to study something that I found out later was called women's studies. And the courses I, I had to take in my first year were all introductions to. So it was introduction to social science, introduction to political science, introduction to policy, introduction to philosophy. Introduc so it was introductions, 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 which was a multidisciplinary setting um, that looking back, I infused with feminism in order to connect the dots. Because multidisciplinarity doesn't necessarily mean that you get structure, that you get uh, a way of connecting all these, uh, all these different dots, all these different domains. I found out that I was missing the humanities because I had to do all this work on my own. Uh, epistemology is not necessarily something that is, that is being taught uh, in the social sciences. I don't know enough about the natural sciences curricula to, to, confirm, or to confirm this for the natural sciences, but um, epistemology was simply not there. Uh, knowledge production was done as if intuitively. And uh, that is something that I already, that I learned through feminism at the age of 15. Um, I, blah, stupid sentence. But I learned at the age of 15 that knowledge production is something very active. It doesn't come natural. It is a perspective that you actively take on and that you transform along the way. Uh, this was not something that was part of the social sciences uh, in, 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 at the end of the 90s, no. What happened in gender studies was that I was trained in all kinds of methodology courses, in all kinds of uh, epistemology courses, also because this was one of the fascinations of my teacher, Petra de Vries. Um, but I was so passionate and so fascinated by, by this topic that I basically studied so fast that the University of Amsterdam gave me a grant for a second degree. And then I went to philosophy of science. I knew that I had to do philosophy of science because I, I wanted to do more and more epistemology and methodology. 
Of course, the problem started right there because philosophy of science is not um, very feminist. Uh, my teacher basically told me that, okay, Iris, you have to now leave your feminist glasses behind, which for me was impossible because feminism and knowledge production were intrinsically connected in my world. And philosophy of science is literally philosophy of science. It is what it says it is. It's, it, it has a science bias. So the, the two fields that I worked with, that I had worked with, so, um, social science and humanities, were not really present in that curriculum. So my thesis in philosophy of science was called Humanities in Action after Bruno Latour's Science in Action. And I tried to write about the humanities as a field of knowledge production. And I tried to unpack uh, what that knowledge production then consists of. And then I came to Utrecht University in order to do my PhD in feminist epistemology because uh, doing feminist epistemology was not possible at the University of Amsterdam. There was uh, no real graduate program, postgraduate program at the University of Amsterdam in women's studies, gender studies. And philosophy didn't appear to be very happy with a feminist philosophy of the humanities. So uh, I needed to, to make this combination elsewhere and that's why I came to Utrecht. I, I worked uh, 12 and a half years in the gender studies program. Um, I helped uh, build many of the recent um, infrastructures uh, in gender. I tried to um, enrich the curriculum with uh, actually, strangely enough, a science-oriented um, science oriented methodologies, themes, concepts, um, because of my work in a field that is called new materialism. Um, gender studies, however, these days is becoming uh, very, very specialized and very professionalized. So the students that come in, especially on the graduate level, they're incredibly professional and they know exactly what kind of niche they want to work in. And um, uh, as White had already said in 1925, uh, it's the modern world that has created professionals and professionals are thinkers in a groove. They are minds in a groove. That's what he says in, in Science in the Modern World. And the minute I realized that gender studies is actually becoming a groove and losing its uh, connection uh, sometimes, I'm yet not saying that this is always the case, but with uh, the world outside of the university, um, with disciplines that are not feminist, um, I, I felt that I needed to contribute elsewhere in order to actually work, of course, with and as a feminist scholar. But approaching gender studies now as a discipline, as a neo-discipline that needs to be incorporated in the interdisciplinary research process, in team science. At this point, uh, I'm working as an associate professor and the program director of liberal arts and sciences uh, in the humanities faculty here at Utrecht University. Um, the program is part of the School of Liberal Arts because it also hosts uh, a multidisciplinary humanities bachelor. Um, I came to this program because it combines literally, very explicitly, the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, I, I have to change it. So I came to this program because uh, it combines the humanities, the social sciences and the natural sciences. Students are encouraged to choose uh, a major one out of uh, 45 different majors uh, that cover the entire university and we, we offer an interdisciplinary um, curriculum ourselves. And um, what I see uh, and what I've seen already for a couple of years is, is I mean, when you open a newspaper, you see that this, this, these wild and complex problems that we are faced with today cannot be um, cannot be tackled properly, academically, um, from one discipline. So interdisciplinary scholarship for me has always been essential. Philosophy of humanities, uh, gender studies, they're all interdisciplinary fields to some extent, but the, the idea that we are now in an ecological crisis, in a financial crisis, uh, there is a refugee crisis, all these crises you cannot see uh, apart from one another and one crisis is you cannot tackle with one discipline only. So I see that future students need to be trained interdisciplinarily and they want that. It's at this point the largest bachelor program of this faculty. So I think that students uh, see that, hey, we need tools from many different uh, disciplines in order to, 
to deal with the issues that we are facing today. <coughs> the, the, the academic uh, career path was always clear to me. At least it was clear to me um, uh, from the moment I landed in Amsterdam in, um, in, in women's studies. I was one of the few um, students there with an interest in epistemology. My, the University of Amsterdam uh, Women's Studies program and the squad movement in Amsterdam were one. So I studied with squatters, um, I studied with activists. Um, of course, that is something that, could, that enriched my, uh, my academic, uh, my undergrad uh, years very much. But um, I also saw that, um, yeah, how should I phrase this? Shit. Okay, you must it even gaan editen. <laughs> well, studying among, um, among anarchists, among activists, among squatters at the University of Amsterdam uh, made me aware of the fact that there actually was an academic world, a feminist academic world, and that that feminist academic world was one of the, um, was one of the feminist domains, so to speak, one of the feminist infrastructures that also needed to be cared for. And when I saw that I was the only student who was interested in epistemology in radical methodology, I thought, oh, well, then that is probably the part of feminism that, that I will contribute to in order to continue this particular infrastructure. Um, so I never, and, and of course, I've had many, dif many discussions about feminist academia as an activist project at the university. But, but for me, it was more a generational impulse to say, okay, this is, uh, this is also a feminist product, this is also a feminist infrastructure, and I want to contribute and continue with that. So the fact that there is not much stillness in, uh, in, in the academic world these days, uh, was, I, was very, I was made aware of this when I saw the movie Hannah Arendt, uh, made by Van Trotta. Um, and when I saw Hannah Arendt basically laying on the couch, uh, you know, all day in order to think and also fleeing to the woods uh, during debates about her own work. And her point was, uh, I'm not going to um, engage with these debates simply because I know that this is just some sort of temporary riot and it, this is not about the basic concepts and the real insights uh, that I have produced or that, that should be discussed. I think it's a real danger today. Um, the, the, the very fast moving, over corporatized university um, uh, that, that we are now working in. I'm concerned about it. I, I know that it is important to take the summer off, basically, in order to write. And I've always done that. The last couple of years, I've always had a summer project for two months, a reading project, not necessarily a writing project, uh, because there's no time otherwise. The university today uh, consists of teaching, consists of research, consists of applying for grants. And whereas I've been successful and I got personal grants, networking grants, um, it is also something that adds to the academic work. I think it is to some extent a good thing because grants, especially networking grants that are not just for your personal research, they also they allow for a lot of exchange, they allow for um, unusual combinations. They are actually interdisciplinary spaces in and of themselves uh, in a transnational academic context. Um, the personal grants are necessary for, for, for quiet contemplation and writing. I know that for a fact. Uh, I could not have been at Harvard University for half a year without a personal grant because there's always the teaching, there's always the admin. I think the main issue for the humanities today is to actively affirm and embrace the fact that interdisciplinarity now is needed. The fact that many um, scholars of my generation move to fields like environmental humanities, medical humanities, health humanities, already um, tells you that interdisciplinarity, at least by my generation, is being embraced and that we are not scared to source uh, disciplines that we haven't been trained in. Um, so a movement um, that is a, human a movement of humanists um, um, that are inward looking 
is something that I find only interesting because I think that interdisciplinarity cannot exist without disciplines. So I value the work of scholars that decide that the humanities methodology also needs a lot of attention and a lot of care. But at the same time, I see the main challenges um, in interdisciplinary, inter on interdisciplinary intersections of fields. And I, I see a lot of gender studies scholars today, post-colonial studies scholars today, move in directions similar to the direction I recently moved in. Liberal arts and sciences, environmental humanities, medical humanities, all these kinds of humanities are now being uh, picked up by gender studies scholars in particular, uh, by post-colonial anti-racist scholars in particular, because they want to be challenged. They want societal problems, societal issues to be at the core of their work. They actually are critical of um, a, a specialization, a professionalization of the discipline. I have not given up on developing an epistemology for the humanities. Uh, this is also because my epistemology for the humanities um, is, has never been um, classificatory, it has never been systematic, it has never been historical. Because I see these, for example, the idea of um, systematic philosophy that starts with the isms and looks through the isms to the works, um, that has always been reductive to me. Of course, feminism is also an ism, and, and I found out by doing my PhD that also feminism is sometimes um, reductive and doesn't have an eye for this fantastic Foucauldian idea that a statement refers to something irreducible. Um, I want to do justice to that irreducibility. I think that the humanities are uh, capable of doing it. Um, but we need um, to be flexible and creative with the structures that the humanities itself offers. I think, in fact, that it is more, it is in the curriculum that these isms and these, um, these rigid structures are offered. I don't think that humanities scholars themselves work from uh, a particular ism uh, and then approach their material. There's always, of course, a humanities, that's, that's what I say in class, you never know when you are a humanities scholar, when, you, when you're actually doing your work. Is it because you're uh, sitting on the train, um, opening a magazine, that somebody has left behind, you see a painting and you're like, I want to see this painting in real and I want to write about it. At that point, you've just become a humanities scholar uh, and because, because you've been interpolated by something that you found uh, on the train in this example. Um, but the, in the curriculum, we usually teach uh, in, in very rigid, very linear ways. We don't do that in the natural sciences. And I remember that at Utrecht University, uh, during my PhD years, um, we actually went to campus, to the natural sciences for the first time, and we found out about nonlinear causality. And we decided, wow, they are actually more advanced than we are. So um, that was the birth of uh, a lot of work at Utrecht in which we try to, to, to cross the two cultures. Uh, I always find interdisciplinarity a little bit counterintuitive because when you, when you think about uh, what I just said, a statement refers to something irreducible, you actually start with the irreducibility of um, life, of life itself, and the fact that it cannot be captured in, uh, according to a disciplinary perspective. Interdisciplinarity, to some extent, also starts with the disciplines that you then have to integrate. So two, inter two disciplinary perspectives uh, that you integrate. So I find it a little bit uh, counterintuitive, although I love uh, the interdisciplinary research process and, and seeing students grow and pick up disciplinary glasses in order to leave them behind later. Um, the end works with me. Liberal arts and sciences and social sciences and so maybe we, we just need um, multiple ends. <laughs>